Throughout history, there has been confusion between the words rocket and missile. A rocket generally refers to a device which after launch is recovered using a parachute or streamer. A missile is defined as a flying device which is not covered. Therefore, any flying device which explodes or otherwise is destroyed on impact is a missile, not a rocket. Around 1200 CE, the Chinese developed a method for containing their black powder that allowed them to produce the earliest forms of rockets. Tightly packing the powder into long cardboard tubes caused it to burn very quickly, generating large amounts of thrust. With the addition of a nozzle at the bottom of the combustion chamber, the thrust was increased even further. Originally used as weapons of war, Chinese rockets utilized long stabilizing stakes and relatively large explosive charges in the heads of the rockets. These so-called fire arrows were feared by all enemies. Due to their relatively simple design, they could be produced in large quantities and fired in rapid succession. It wasn't until the mid-17th century that rocket technology began to advance. In 1650, a Polish artillery expert named Kazimierz Simonowicz, Simonowicz published drawings and descriptions of a multiple-stage rocket, the first in written history. The Era of Modern Rocketry Perhaps the greatest period of advanced in rocketry occurred during the lifetime of Dr. Robert Goddard. As the father of modern rocketry, Goddard's work in the field of liquid-fueled rocketry thrusted the world into a new age. Growing up in central Massachusetts, he theorized about high-altitude spaceflight early in his career. In 1912, he proposed a design for a multiple-staged rocket capable of reaching the moon, but his idea was quickly shot down as being absurdly impossible. He went on to prove that a rocket would work in complete vacuum, an idea that was crucial to the development of space travel. To stabilize his finless rockets, Goddard developed a gyroscopic stabilization system which kept even the most unfit for a flight vehicle airborne. By 1926, he had successfully tested and flown the first liquid-fueled rocket. His contributions to modern rocketry reach far beyond his development of the first flying liquid-fueled rocket. Goddard's creative thinking and open mind inspired others to follow his path, eventually leading to the space race in the 1960s. By the mid-1950s, the world had been well exposed to the destructive forces of military missiles. It was at this point that people began to see the scientific uses of rockets as well. In 1958, the United States founded the National Aeronautics and Space Administration to provide for research into the problems of flight within and outside the Earth's atmosphere. One of the first goals of the new Space Administration was to build a successful rocket capable of lifting a large payload to the moon. The Apollo program, which started in 1961, had one basic goal, to land man on the moon. On 28 January 1968, a very large and complex rocket was launched from a pad at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Apollo 5 was one of the first fully successful launch vehicles and laid the foundation for the rocket that would change the world. On the other side of the Atlantic, German scientists were beginning to play a major role in the development of rockets. Inspired by Hermann Obert's ideas on rocket travel, the mathematics of spaceflight and the practical design of rockets published in his book, Die Rocket zu den Planeten Raumen, The Rocket to Space, a number of rocket societies and research institutes were founded in Germany. The German bicycle and car manufacturer Opel, now part of GM, began developing rocket-powered cars and in 1928, Fritz von Opel drove the Opel Rack 1 on a racetrack. In 1929, this design was extended to the Opel Sander Rack 1 airplane, which crashed during its first flight in Frankfurt. In the Soviet Union, the Gas Dynamics Laboratory in Leningrad, under the directorship of Valentin Glushko, built more than 100 different engine designs, 
experimenting with different fuel injection techniques. Under the directorship of Werner von Braun and Walter Dornberger, the Verein for Raumschifffahrt or Society for Space Travel played a pivotal role in the development of the Vergiltungswaffe 2, also known as the V2 rocket, the most advanced rocket of its time. The V2 rocket burned a mixture of alcohol as fuel and liquid oxygen as oxidizer, and it achieved great amounts of thrust by considerably improving the mass flow rate of fuel to about 150 kilograms, 380 pound per second. The V2 featured much of the technology we see on rockets today, such as turbo pumps and guidance systems, and due to its range of around 300 kilometers, 190 miles, the V2 could be launched from the shores of the Baltic to bomb London during World War II. The 1,000 kilogram, 2,200 pound explosive warhead fitted in the tip of the V2 was capable of devastating entire city blocks but still lacked the accuracy to reliably hit specific targets. Towards the end of World War II, German scientists were already planning much larger rockets, today known as Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles ICBMs, that could be used to attack the United States and were strapping rockets to aircraft either for powering them or for vertical takeoff. With the fall of the Third Reich in April 1945, a lot of this technology fell into the hands of the Allies. The Allies' rocket program was much less sophisticated, such that a race ensued to capture as much of the German technology as possible. The Americans alone captured 300 crane loads of V-2 rocket parts and shipped them back to the United States. Furthermore, the most prominent of the German rocket scientists emigrated to the United States partly due to the much better opportunities to develop rocketry there and partly to escape the repercussions of having played a role in the Nazi war machine. The V-2 essentially evolved into the American Redstone rocket, which was used during the Mercury project. The Space Race to the Moon and Beyond After World War II, both the United States and the Soviet Union began heavily funding research into ICBMs, partly because these had the potential to carry nuclear warheads over long distances and partly due to the allure of being the first to travel to space. In 1948, the U.S. Army combined a captured V-2 rocket with a WAC Corporal rocket to build the largest two-stage rocket to be launched in the United States. This two-stage rocket was known as the Bumper WAC and over a course of six flights reached a peak altitude of 400 kilometers 250 miles, pretty much exactly to the altitude where the International Space Station ISS orbits today. Despite these developments, the Soviets were the first to put a man-made object orbit into space, i.e. an artificial satellite. Under the leadership of chief designer Sergei Korolev, the V-2 was copied and then improved upon in the R-1, R-2, and R-5 missiles. At the turn of 1950s, the German designs were abandoned and replaced with the inventions of Alexei Mikhailovich, ICIV, which was used as the basis for the first Soviet ICBM, the R-7. The R-7 was further developed into the Vostok rocket, which launched the first satellite, Sputnik 1, into orbit on October 4, 1957. A mere 12 years after the end of World War II, the launch of Sputnik 1 was the first major news story of the space race. Only a couple of weeks later, the Soviets successfully launched Sputnik 2 into orbit with Dog Laika on board. One of the problems that the Soviets did not solve was atmospheric re-entry. Any object wishing to orbit another planet requires enough speed such that the gravitational attraction towards the planet is offset by the curvature of planet surface. However, during re-entry, this causes the orbiting body to literally smash into the atmosphere, creating incredible amounts of heat. In 1951, H.J. Allen and A.J. Eggers discovered that a high drag, blunted shape, not a low drag teardrop, counterintuitively minimizes the re entry effects by redirecting 99% of the energy into the surrounding atmosphere. 
Allen and Eggers' findings were published in 1958 and were used in the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and Soyuz manned space capsules. This design was later improved upon in the space shuttle, whereby a shockwave was induced on the heat shield of the space shuttle via an extremely high angle of attack in order to deflect most of the heat away from the heat shield. Where do we go from here? As we've seen, over the last 2,000 years, rockets have evolved from simple toys and military weapons to complex machines capable of transporting humans into space. To date, rockets are the only viable gateway to places beyond Earth. Furthermore, we've seen that the development of rockets has not always followed a unidirectional path towards improvement. Our capability to send heavier and heavier payloads into space peaked with the development of the Saturn V rocket. This great technological leap was fueled, to a large extent, by the competitive spirit of the Soviet Union and the United States. Unprecedented funds were available to rocket scientists on both sides during the 1950 to 1970s. Furthermore, dreamers and visionaries such as Jules Verne, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, and Jean Roddenberry sparked the imagination of the public and garnered support for the space programs. However, the successes of incumbent companies, their fierce competition, and visionary goals of colonizing Mars are once again inspiring a younger generation. This is, once again, an exciting time for rocketry. That wraps up the video. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and don't forget to press the bell icon to stay notified about our uploads. I'll see you next time. Till then, peace out.